Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. As many of you know, we are going through, we are doing a road map of Lent. We're going through the different Sundays and the different readings because, as the Bunim Shoi told us last week, there's a special grace working through the readings. There is a calling from the church for something in these readings, and we want to hear the call. We want to respond to the call, and we want to go on this journey that God is calling us to. He talked about how, Abu Nabi talked to us last week about how we are on a journey to the kingdom of God. And he said, it's Christ that fasts, even until now he fasts with us, he fasts for us, and he fasted for our salvation. But more than he, did he fast for our salvation, what Abuna talked about last week is that he fasted not just that we would be saved, not that we would be cleansed from sin, but that we would be sanctified. And then he talked about a little bit how all of us have some weak spot. He talked about like a house with an open window that many of us are unaware of and how the devil wants to creep in through those open windows of our lives and sometimes God does his best in our lives to expose the different things that you are unaware of in order for you to fight it. It's one thing to know who your enemy is, to keep your eyes out for it everywhere you go. But it's another thing with such a sneaky, clever enemy who's mastered the art of war. How are we supposed to fight against him? How are we supposed to fight against a, a person who's been fighting the same war for seven, eight, ten thousand years since the creation of the world? This coming week, we're going to dive into the readings leading up to the prodigal son. So like we said, today is Temptation Sunday, but all the readings of this last week that we just passed are the readings of Temptation Sunday. Tomorrow, starting from tomorrow, are the readings that lead up to the prodigal son. And so what we're doing is we're trying to prepare our hearts for this next step on the journey to the kingdom of God, this next step in the death and the resurrection of us all. Today we're going to talk about the prodigal son and coming to yourself. What I want to do is I want to take it verse by verse. I think a lot of us know the big picture of the story, right? Father has two sons, one asks for money, leaves, sins, falls, comes back to the father, father accepts, glory be to God for every amen. But we have to understand, maybe a lot of us think, well, I'm not the prodigal son. I can't relate. I can't say that I've reached a point that the prodigal son has in himself in the depths of sin. Maybe I can't relate to him. We are going to take it verse by verse to try to understand exactly what this story is telling us. So it starts out in Luke 15, verse 11. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he invited them, he divided them to him, his livelihood. First, you have to understand. We have to hear the story as the people that Jesus told the story to. It says that Christ was surrounded with tax collectors and sinners. And these tax collectors and sinners came to him to hear them, to hear Christ. He saw them and he saw that before him were tax collectors and sinners. And also there were scribes and listening from a little bit off. But Christ's direct audience were those that were tax collectors and sinners. And so before we continue, you need to ask yourself, I'm coming here to hear the word of God. I'm coming to hear his voice, hear what he has to say. Who are you? Are you the scribes and the Pharisees? All the people that are just coming to see, what does he have to say? What is he going to tell us that we don't know? Or are you like the tax collectors and sinners who know themselves very well, who have all these thoughts in their minds about who they are and about who God might be? Some of them might be deceptive. Some of them might be wrong. Some of them might be hopeful. And so they're sitting there and we're listening. But as you look at the words of the story, the key word is Father. 
The key word is Father. When Christ describes the interaction of God between sinners, He describes it as a father with His children. And as a father, He's opening up for Himself the responsibility that I have to take care of my children. You see, He's not our guardian. He's our Father. He is not just a, a, a soldier with a fire sword. He is a Father who wants the absolute best. There is no Father who wants to see his son or his daughter fail. There's no father. Every father wants to see, unfortunately, some of them too much, and so they become extra critical, extra picky, extra perfectionist with their children because they want the best for their children. He is father by all meanings of the word father. But what is the issue with the son? And here he says, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. You have to read between the lines in the story. When you hear the whole story of the prodigal son, you don't see the father as somebody who's aggressive, right? You don't see him as somebody critical. You don't see him as somebody who's all strict. You don't see him as somebody who is putting his son down. He's a son. He's a father that respects the freedom of his son. And so you wonder, what? that drew this son away from his father's house? What that tugged on his heart, that tugged on his life, pulling him away, trying to tell him, try something else. You don't see in any of the story any faults among the father. Even when the older son complained, he said, you never did for me. He went to him. He explained to him. He says, you've always been with me. I love you. We, we're happy that our son has returned. He was dead and now he's alive. And you see in the case of the father... That the younger son has no excuse to take away this stuff and go away. So we're going to try to look and to see what it was. The first thing is that his eyes were on the riches of the father, but not on the enjoyment of fellowship with the father. He could say, my dad has riches. My dad has some type of benefit for me. I want it. You know who exactly is like that? The people of Israel, when they were in the wilderness... God is parting seas. There's a pillar of fire guiding them by, by night. There's a cloud that's covering them from the sun by day. He's giving them manna from heaven. He's parting seas. He's bringing them quiet. He's pulling water out of rocks. He's doing absolutely everything he can to enjoy fellowship with the people. What are the people saying? We're sick of this manna. Get us up. We want something more miss the pots of meat that we sat by in the year in the deserts of Egypt we miss the things of the world and so he had his mind fixed on some type of benefit just like the Israelites even to the point where Moses is going up and down climbing the mountain meeting God and the people just whatever he tells you he tells you like okay that's all we don't care what he tells you just get us to the promised land. All is the promised land. And the whole time, they're complaining to God, and they're complaining to Moses, and they are pitiful people, not because of any other reason. You see the call of the people of Israelites from God to enjoy fellowship with Him. Look at all this that I'm giving you. Look at all this I'm giving you. Give us the promised land. We're sick of the wilderness. Same type of people. The enjoyment, want the riches of the Father, but not fellowship with the Father. So God doesn't force us by any means to honor or to love Him. He gives us our freedom to choose exactly what we want. And then in the next verse, verse 13 says, And not many days after the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. We're going to try to understand what it was when it says he journeyed to a far country. He journeyed to a far country. It is the life which is, in which God is absent. It is that life that says, I'm going to move away and try other things. It is that life that says, it's okay if God stays in one part of my life, but the other compartments of my life, there's really no room for him. And so any place that is far 
from God, any place in your life that does not have God's presence in it, your relationships, all relationships, your social outings, your family life, the integrity that you show in your work life, the honesty that you show every day and your faithfulness that you show in this world, every part that you have a part in your life, you say, okay, I'll go to church, I'll fast the fast, I'll do some things, but this stuff, God really doesn't care about. No, He cares about it all. And that life in which God is absent, it's the difference between a worldly life and a heavenly life. When a person leaves God out of the places of her life, he loses the grace of the Father given to him. He begins to lose everything. As soon as you have compartments in your life, that don't have God in them, the end result is that you will begin slowly to waste and to lose everything. What it is, it's the loss of sight of the goal. It's a life that has no goal. It's unintentional living. It's I'm going through the motions. I have no goal, but I'm hoping that I'm going to get there. I just go through these motions. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell us, go through the motions... And you'll just find yourself in the kingdom of God. And that is exactly the problem of the church today. The church today is going through the motions, doing what we have to do, but so many other things are tugging on our heart. We are going to see what is it that is tugging on the heart of this prodigal son. Revelation chapter 9, verses 2 to 4 says, And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke lo locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Do you understand what this means? This is a a vision that St. John is having in the book of Revelation in which the devil was cast into the furnace of fire, into the bottomless pit, and then all these locusts start to sneak out. Sherry tells me, like, she's usually falling asleep at the time when we're reading Revelation on Bright Saturday, and it's usually the time of, like, locusts with helmets that she wakes up and she, like, doesn't know what's going on and she feels like she's being attacked. It's that same feeling. You don't understand what this means. When he tells, when they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, you want to know what's happening is that he's saying, it's a form of battle that the people of God have not contended with before. You know, in the earth, it was open persecution. Nobody could wake up in the morning without thinking, I might lose my life today. I might be tested for my faith and I have to be able to answer whether I believe in God or I don't. And every night they went to sleep, and every morning they would have this on their mind. Devil became a little bit more subtle. He said, you know what? This generation is different. Let's try something different. Let's creep into their lives without them knowing. Let them go to church. Let them pray. Let them confess. Let them fast. Let them Let them don't fight them in the way. I don't want all the I want you to sneak in. And it might be sneaking in through the call of the world. That love of the world. The Bible tells us that the devil is the prince of this world. He is running the affairs of this world. And he has one goal. It is your destruction. And he begins, little by little, to lure you in. It's not open persecution. You'd be too smart for that. You'd wake up in the morning thinking, I'm ready. I'm ready to pray. I'm ready to fight. I'm, God. I'm ready to answer for my faith. But the devil, in the last days, sneaks in through technology, through media, through the ways of the world, through the governments, through this, through the love of money, through all the things that we're facing every day without realizing that you are facing an enemy. You see a soldier with a sword threatening your life, you know your enemy. But when you're saying, oh, it's just internet, it's just media, it's just Facebook. It's just a little bit of social gatherings. It's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. 
And all of a sudden, you find the prodigal son decides, hey, I'm leaving. I'm leaving my father's house. Like I said earlier today in the gospel, somebody like Solomon the wise. Solomon the wise, at the end of his life, in his old age, imagine a man in his old age with the wisdom that God gave him from heaven, his whole life, son of David, with all the history of Israel and the way that God worked in their lives. And it says in, the, in his old age, he let his wives turn his heart after idols. It's a slow-moving attempt by the devil to draw your ha- heart away from, from God. The kingdom of God is not eating or drinking. The kingdom of God, in Romans chapter 14, it says very clear, the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but it is righteousness and peace and and joy in the Holy Spirit. It is living in the Holy Spirit. It is communion with God. It cannot be, I'm doing what I'm asked to do. Leave me alone. That's exactly the issue. It's not about the fellowship with the Father. It's doing what I have to do. And then verse 14 says, but when we had spent all, but when he had spent all, there arose a severe Famine in that land, and he began to be in want. The sinner, or the normal person, who moves his heart away from God, who allows themselves to have certain compartments in their life where there's no presence of God, will find that they are going to go through a spiritual famine. It is a spiritual dryness. Every time I try, I pray, I don't feel anything. My heart is cold. I'm distracted. I'm not there. There's no connection. It's this, dry, this dryness, this famine. It's a stony heart. You ever met that person that has just a stony heart? You know, you talk to them, the door Maybe you were at that point in your life where you had a stony heart. You were living in the time of famine. It is one choice after the, another. The first day wasn't famine. He began to waste his possessions. Famine, starving, and he began to be in want. The world is going to leave you vulnerable more and more through the way it draws you in. It's going to leave you vulnerable. Where at one point you realize, I don't have any strength. We were attending the men's stepping up event, and one of the pastors said something very powerful. He said, in times of strength, set for yourselves plans for times of weakness. In times of strength, set for yourself plans for times of weakness. Maybe right now, you've taken communion, you've heard the word of God, you feel strong. You don't feel this extra push to, to, to do anything because you're fine. Everything is going well. But there's going be a time when you've eaten too much, when you've been fought too much by the devil, when your passions are, are starting to pull on you, your lusts, your desires, they're, they're tugging on you. It is at that point that you're too vulnerable, that when you stand and you feel like I'm vulnerable with temptation before me, I fall. So what do you do? In times of strength, in times where you feel strength, where you don't feel weak, where you feel like I have the grace of God working in me, set up Walls of protection for your heart. Go protect your internet. Go protect your TVs. Go protect your... Delete those numbers off your cell phone that you know keep on tempting you to text back and to to build this impure relationship with. Times of strength where you feel connected to God, it's at that time where you can analyze yourself and say, wait a second. This is the time where maybe I should deactivate Facebook. Whatever it may be. When the famine comes, it's a season of a loss of grace incurred by the indulgence of sin. You know what God does? God in His love for you. Throughout the whole story, you are going to see the love of God. God has grace. What He does is when He sees that you're going down a certain path and your heart is becoming hard, what God does is He pulls away His grace away from you. 
you say, how cruel of God. How cruel of God remove His grace from protecting me. But what He does is, when He pulls away His grace, you begin to realize the battle in front of you. You begin to fall. You might realize, I need God. When He pulls away Grace is when the times you're going to find yourselves feeling in want. All from God's unfailing love. You see that when he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he set him into his fields to feed swine, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. No one gave him anything. He found himself dragged into impurity. Impurity. We are living in a very impure generation. We live in a very impure world. Everything on TV goes back to sex. Everything on the road goes back to sex. Every movie goes back to sex. Every book, every picture you see in the mall goes back to sex. You know the answer. You know tugging on our hearts. We live in a generation that is tugging on the purity of our hearts and the purity of those around us. And what happens is, the worst part is that the world abandoned him. And no one gave him anything. And that's exactly what the devil's goal is. The devil, like I said earlier, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He has no other plans for your life. But I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. His goal is to strip you naked and then to walk away from you. I don't know you. You see, it's not a marriage between you and the devil. Maybe the devil. Maybe he'll give me joy and satisfaction and pleasure. No, just for a little bit. And then he'll drag you down to a place where you become in want. What God does is he destroys all the supports of our self indulgence. Out of love. Out of love. God destroys every part of self-indulgence in your life that is supporting you. Cool picture, huh? <laughs> the first thing, when you look at the miserable things that the prodigal son endured and had to go through, if you read between the lines, you see God's grace. First thing is, his self. His self-indulgence caused him to plunge into poverty. If it were maybe he wouldn't have gone into poverty and he would have continued going down that <clears throat> path. God, because he loves you, is removing those things that you're relying on. And things are falling apart. And you begin to feel the emptiness of sin. You begin to think, feel this huge gap between you and God. Another thing is that he indulged in his relationships. How many of us, you might think, we're not talking about the heart that his brother was talking about. He was indulging in his relationships. His whole mind, his whole being was surrounded in enjoying a good time with his friends, doing everything he could to indulge in his relationships. What did God do? He began to break the supports, one leg at a time, so that he realizes not even those around me. Have you ever gotten to that place in your spiritual life? Where you even look to your friends and you say, even my friends are pitiful. Even the people that are around me, who we have a, co a connection, but it's not a bond. It's not a spiritual tie. And so, little by little, we began to lose the flavor or that taste, that sweet taste of the friendship. And that's by the grace of God. God, in His goodness, begins to remove the supports of our self in dungeons. Indulgence. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to them, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. This whole healing process for the prodigal son started in verse 17 when he came to himself. The world has a cycle of slavery, of business, distraction, no entertainment, and its pur purpose is to draw you 
away from yourself. And the devil has one goal, to keep you away from yourself. You know how hard it is to actually dig deep down into the heart in such a, an age when we're all distracted? All of us are distracted. There are people that are on their cell phones 24-7 in meetings and Bible studies and sermons and liturgies in everything. We are on our, our phones connected to the whole world. Not connected to God. Not connected to God. And the whole thing that this person did which gave him the success of his repentance was that he came to himself. The first step in turning back to God is coming back to yourself. You'll notice in the prayers of the Agbeya, the church draws us back to ourselves even to a point where we are speaking to our soul. And we say, repent therefore, O my, o my, ba o my soul, for your bad deeds and your ugly evils. What answer will you give lying on the bed of si sin, negligent to subdue the flesh? The church is calling us, speak to your Speak to yourself, come to yourself and look and see what it is that you'll discover. He asked himself, what's the best case scenario? To have an abundance of bread like, my like in my father's house like the servants. The servants have an abundance of bread, that's the best case scenario. So he came to this deep realization and this is where the mystery happens in the story of the prodigal son. All of a sudden, He's indulging, indulging, indulging with harlots and the swine and the food and the mud and all that he's indulging. God, in his great love, created this deep dissatisfaction within himself. This is the visiting of God's grace. You see, God cares for your salvation. God cares for your sanctification. He wants you to come back to the kingdom of God. And the only way that will happen knowing how we are when we come and face our sins. He visits us with His grace. When He came to Himself, God's grace came, and He could realize the deep dissatisfaction. There was a time in my life where I felt a deep sorrow and depression from the condition of being far away from God. There were times where I hated myself. I was depressed. I felt this gap and I got to realize this dissatisfaction. You all in your hearts have a God-shaped hole. Nothing will quench the desires of that heart except for God himself. You can put any other thing into that hole. Nothing will quench that dissatisfaction until you meet God himself. It's not an easy thing to come back to yourself. It takes a lot of courage to look within yourself and to face the reality of the state of your sin. And I see that again in confession. In confession, lots of young people, they come and they just confess one thing or two things. And maybe they're saints, but nobody has one or two sins. I'm sorry. Nobody has one or two sins. If you only have one or two sins, please contact me. We are ready to nominate you for, the, for a bishop or a patriarch of the Church of Alexandria. Like we're looking for people with courage to be honest with themselves and admit, no, I have a lot of sin. When I really look at myself, don't compare myself to the joke next to me. I compare myself between the standards of God. I stand before the Word of God and I say, these are the standards. Where do I fall with these standards? When He came to Himself, that realization opened up His eyes. St. Macario says, grace works in our souls as a kind of leaven. It does not immediately eliminate sin, but it does allow us to progressively recognize it for what it is. It is a foreign body to, ex to be excised from the soul. Acknowledge your sin and conf confess your sin and take the place of humility. One of the biggest obstacles to coming to ourselves and admitting our sin is the obstacle of pride. It's the obstacle of pride. St. James tells us, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So a month and a half ago, or a month ago, Sherry and I went to Weekend to Remember. It's this marriage conference that gets to a couple to get together and examine their relationship. And we had to write a letter to each other, and I began to write to her saying things that I wish she would change about herself, and that's part of the project. So as I began to write, 
like one word, two words, not, not much. Even the things that I discovered that I wanted her to change about herself are things that God put in her for my sanctification. If God from her, I'd turn into a monster. My pride would maybe give me the, the desire to walk all over and not give her anything, but sometimes when there's a pushback a little bit, when there's some type of critical spirit, sometimes, once every 10 years, you begin to realize if I asked her to remove the things, I'd be a monster. Nobody would be a At church, people say, I want to pray. I'm king. And so, there are things in our lives. There are obstacles that prevent us from coming back to God. One of those is pride. And God allows certain people in your life to keep you there. St. Isaac the Syrian says, the grace of the Holy Spirit will come to you in direct proportion to your humility. A lot of us think that humility is like, it's a virtue. No, it is a virtue leading to all other virtues. Unless you have humility, count everything else not there. It is, the, it is the first among all virtues. If you do not have it, you will have no other virtue. Humility is what we must pursue. St. James says, God opposes the proud. He opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. I'll tell you a story about even what the devil told St. Macarius. When Ava Macarius was returning from the marsh, from his cell one day, carrying some palm leaves, he met the devil on the road with a scythe. The latter struck at him as much as he pleased, but in vain, and he said to him, What is your power, Macarius, that makes me powerless against you? All that you do, I do too. You fast, I don't even eat. You keep vigil, and I don't sleep at all. In one thing only do you beat me. Ava Macarius asked what that was. He said, Your humility, because of that, I can do nothing against you. I can do nothing against you if you have humility. Imagine, imagine if we pursued humility. If we could be honest with ourselves, the devil would have nothing against you. There's a story of a monk who was praying in his cell. And the devil appeared to him in the form of an angel and began to tell the monk, you are truly the most saintly monk of all the monks of the monastery. None of these monks are even worthy to be around you because of the power of your prayers. And so the monk began to listen more. And so the angel told him, come meet me tomorrow on top of the monastery wall. God wants to take you to heaven like Elijah. You're a true man of God, and we're going to carry you away in a chariot. So he goes, he stands on the wall, he gets ready in the morning, says his prayers, stands up on the wall, and all of a sudden the chariot appears. And he says, my time has come in which God is going to honor me. And he jumps in that chariot, the chariot becomes invisible. The monk falls off the wall and dies and loses his soul in his pride. The hardest thing to do is to admit that you have pride or to admit that there are certain sins in your life that you need to face and you need to address. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But Isaiah 57 verse 15 says, for thus says the high and lofty one, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. Imagine. God says, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones to the place of coming to our humility, that the Father has come to meet us, that the Father will come to meet us and take us to the kingdom. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he still was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. This next point is the resolve to res to to rise from your fall. It's one thing to come to yourself and acknowledge and say, yeah, I have a bad attitude. Yeah, I have a little pride. But who doesn't? Right? We all 
And we get to the point where we can push down the grace that is working in us to change. But the next step is to resolve to rise, to make the decision to say, this sin I'm going to put before God that he would give me victory over it. It's not just the big and ugly stuff. It's even the small things that God is calling us to. You see, have you acknowledged your sins and admitted them? I think God far exceeded his expectations, or the Father exceeded his expectations when he approached him. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 8, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. When you come to God, and you admit your sin, and you admit your weakness, and then you resolve that I'm going to rise from my fall, our God, who is rich in mercy, with which, with, because of his great love with which he loved us, will make us alive together with him. And then we conclude the story. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come. And because he has received his sa him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I may, might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots... You killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. First thing, we need to come to ourselves and be honest. Second thing is, to approach God in humility and resolve to rise from our falls. And how does the Father meet him? He sees him a far way off. It is though the father was waiting for him the whole time. This is one who has taken his father and blow, his, his inheritance and blown it among, blow, blew it away on harlots. But the father was waiting from a far way off. And then as he was confessing, the father didn't even listen to his confession. He said, bring me the best robe. The best robe in the house is the father's robe. He gave his son his own honor his own righteousness. And he said, I'm clothing you with my righteousness. And then he said, give him a ring. That ring is restoring his sonship and saying, you are like the firstborn son in the house. What you claim is yours in this house because you are a son of God. You have entered into the house. In Christ, you have authority. You have authority over your enemies. You have authority over so many things, even your own passions. And the same thing was that he clothed his feet with sandals. You know, the servants used to walk around barefoot in the houses. It was only the people that wore shoes that were actual members of the house. The last point is that you even see the unfailing love with the older son. But what's the issue with the older son? Self-righteousness. So maybe you can't identify at all with the prodigal son. Maybe you are not doing what the prodigal son has done. My concern for you is that you might be finding yourself or identifying with the older son. He found himself with this self-righteousness. I've obeyed all the commandments in your home. You deserve to give me a celebration. He was missing that paradise feeling of the home because, again, he never had true fellowship with the father. It was all about him. So those that are within the church and those that are going to 
through the motions and doing everything right. Be on guard of your self-righteousness, of the righteousness that tells you you deserve something. Go of how great you are. You see, we're, licking, we're, we're lacking the intimacy of fellowship with the Father. And that's what this whole call is. The Father is calling us. He's coming back and showing us how to get to the kingdom. You have to face Him. You have to face yourself and approach God in humility. Come to yourself and see the true self that is within you and trust in the unfailing love of your Father. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Let us stand up and pray. And the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would open up our eyes. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would give us the eyes to be able to see within ourselves, to see those seeds that have been planted in our hearts by the devil, those things that are tugging away at our, at our hearts that we are completely unaware of, Lord. Give us the strength, give us the grace, give us the humility, Lord to face ourselves and to admit the sins that we are falling in. Not just to admit to ourselves, but to admit to you, Lord, that we need your grace, we need your help. We rely, Lord, on your never-ending compassion. We rely, Lord, on the same mercy that you showed, Lord, to your Son. We thank you for this message in which you showed us, Lord, how you deal with sinners in this kind and merciful way with this prodigal son, Lord. We confess, we admit, we repent, Lord, we come to ourselves and we are honest and admit, Lord, that we are self-indulging in so many different things. Deliver us, Lord. Free us, Lord, from the obstacle of pride. We pray this in your holy and precious name through the intercessions of St. Mary, the prayers of St. Mark, and all your saints. Make us worthy to pray thankfully our Father who art in heaven. Now the love of God the Father, grace of His only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the gift and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, God, in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all.